Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's History at High Noon, Roots of Hope, Rediscovering the Legacy of John Hunter with special guest speaker, City of Raleigh Museum Director, Ernest Dollar. My name is Stacey and I handle adult education over at MOH. We're so glad that you're joining us for today's special program. History at High Noon is just one of many exciting MOH digital offerings available through our History at Home initiative. So if you'd like to learn more, please head over to the museum's website at www.ncmuseumofhistory.org. Before we get started, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our North Carolina Museum of, H of History Associates and Foundation for making today's program possible. Our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programs like this program possible. If you'd like to learn more about becoming an Associates member, you can head over to their website at www.ncmoha.com. We would also like to take this opportunity to thank those of you who graciously donated funds towards today's program. We endeavor to keep our programming free to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping this programming going, and we really appreciate all those of you who have donated funds towards today's program. A few housekeeping tips for today. We ask that you please keep your mic muted throughout the entirety of the program, and to please type any questions that you have for our speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the lecture, fellow MOH educator Nancy Pennington will ask the speaker as many of your questions as time allows. Okay, so it's my honor to introduce today's speaker, City of Raleigh Museum Director Ernie Dollar. Durham native Ernest Dollar began working in historic sites in 1993 after completing his BA in History and BFA in Design from UNC Greensboro. Ernest has worked in several historic parks in North and South Carolina. In 2009, he completed his MA in Public History from North Carolina State University and has served as the Executive Director of the Orange County Historical Museum, Preservation Society of Chapel Hill, and is currently Director of City of Raleigh Museum. Okay, Ernie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome, and thanks for speaking with us today. Well, Stacey, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I appreciate being back uh, on the program for the Museum of History, um, one of my favorite places in Raleigh. And so, yeah, thank you so much for having me and to share this, what is an incredible story that I really can't believe myself that this story came to fruition. Um, so today I kind of want to take you on this journey of, you know, uh, an incredible journey of discovery that, you know, kind of fell into my lap. Um, you know, historians, we've always sort of kind of go down rabbit holes and oftentimes these don't pay any, any dividends on it. But this one uh, is one of those rabbit holes that really had a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And um, it's, a, it's a story that's becoming a very personal story for me as we, as each stage of the story continues to develop. So it is a, it's one of these um, where history is not really that far in the past that the uh, story shows that history is around us today. And it's a, it's a historical chapter that has a bright future to it. So um, today I just kind of want to talk about you about this discovery of this incredible man and his legacy of over three centuries, over eight generations. And it's a truly an American story. And it, it chronicles that incredible experience of the transition from African to American in Raleigh. And so it's a, it's truly opens many doors for many other families and a chapter of one of Raleigh's new and upcoming parks. So today I wanted to kind of tell you about the legacy of, of John Hunter. So the story begins uh, in 2018. Uh, the city of Raleigh Museum worked with the Dix Park Conservancy and the Dix Park staff to really highlight Raleigh's new park. Uh, in 2015, the city of Raleigh bought the uh, previous Dorothea Dix Mental Hospital from the state and wanted to turn it into one of the premier parks. And this is a huge park, about 300 acres with about 85 buildings. So there's a lot to, a lot to see and do there and it's such a rich history. So the City of Raleigh Museum staff began to look at what this exhibit would be. We wanted to talk about certainly the patient experience there. What was that like to be a patient in Dorothea Dix? Uh, we wanted to look at those employees who had worked there for, for decades and had such a tight camaraderie. What was it like to work at the hospital? We wanted to sort of also talk about what was the future of this park? What would, how would Raleigh um, take this mental institution and turn it into this premier park? And as we began to sort of dig into the history of the site, we quickly saw that 
Um, before the hospital was built in 1856, it had been a plantation site. So we felt pretty strongly that we needed to sort of tell the experience of not only the hospital, but the history of the site. So we really started to, to dig into the prehistory of the hospital. And what we quickly found, it was the plantation of Theophilus Hunter. Uh, Theophilus Hunter was one of these uh, quintessential North Carolina patriots. Um, he had um, probably, or his family originated in Gates County, um, had moved into the interior of the developing colony of North Carolina, probably moving to Granville County. And eventually he traveled to and settled in Johnston County, which became Wake County in 1771. And of course, being one of these sort of uh, prosperous men of, of his time, he was uh, involved in the American Revolution, uh, a justice of the peace, uh, quintessential in the founding of Raleigh. Um, so he was just an incredible person at the foundation of not only the American Republic, but North Carolina's capital city. Uh, and this image you see here was the only known image of him, the original painted uh, miniature that the museum was able to purchase uh, last year. So we were incredibly uh, fortunate to have this image, this beautiful image of him painted around 1790. So we know exactly what he looked like and it was just a great piece to, for us to acquire to add to the story. Theopolis Hunter, this is the beautiful miniature that we have of him. So this is now part of the city of Raleigh's collection. So as we decide to try to uncover who Theophilus Hunter was, it required us to do a lot of genealogical work. And we were very fortunate to find images of many of his family. This is a short family tree you see here. Um, it's got sort of his Theophilus, his son Theophilus Hunter Jr., who will be part of our story in a few minutes, and his daughter Adeline and great-great-granddaughter um, Laura. So the hunters were, were very prominent in Raleigh's history and even prehistory. And the more we discovered about Theophilus Hunter, the more he played a central role into the state's history. Um, and this is one of the earliest land grants we have of him appearing in what would become Wake County. Between 1752 and 61, he acquired over 2,000 acres. So he became one of these very early large landowners around Raleigh um, and sort of central North Carolina. And his settlement here was uh, extremely important, and he chose his site well. Um, many of the folks who are familiar with Raleigh might recognize um, a, a comrade or a family member of his, Isaac Hunter of Isaac Hunter's Tavern. Isaac Hunter, uh, who I believe was a, a, either a cousin or a brother of Theophilus, uh, we're trying to figure that out, had his tavern on the north-south road, which came to Virginia down through Fayetteville. So this is sort of right outside the belt line um, going north. But Theophilus chose to put his tavern on this great east-west road, which ran from the coast on to Hillsboro. Now what you see here is an early plat map. And so as we try to uncover Raleigh's earliest roots requires looking at the European land grants. So I've got Raleigh denoted on near the Raleigh, original Raleigh city limits. And the property that you see Theopolis Hunter a little south of that, um, there's a huge open space where we're trying to plug in these mosaics to show where these original land grants were. Now the property we're gonna be focusing on on this map is owned by John Giles Thomas in 1757. So Hunter will acquire this, bring this into this 2000 acres sometimes later. But these are sort of the original land grants that were given to Hunter. Now, if you're traveling south from Raleigh, where Highway 70 and 401 meet, in front of a used car dealership is this teeny tiny small little plaque. And so this is where Theophilus Hunter set up his first plantation house called Hunter's Lodge on the Ramsgate Road. Now, this is uh, important as uh, Governor William Tryon travels into the backcountry to subdue the regulators in 1771. So he stays at Hunter's Lodge and that's an incredible document among itself of his role in the regulation. But this gives us a real great um, marker to where the original Hunter's Lodge was. Um, this is probably the, the only existent picture of the remaining structure taken in the 20s of one of these structures on Hunter's Lodge.
Now, um, after, after Raleigh is found in 1792, um, Hunter, we think, moved closer to the developing capital of North Carolina. Uh, we suspect that Hunter's Lodge probably burned in sometime in the 1790s. And as Raleigh is growing as a, as a local uh, as state capital and attracting more businesses and starts to develop, uh, I feel that Hunter had moved his new home closer to the developing city, which he played an integral part of. So uh, this, this is a Spring Hill Plantation, which still exists, and we'll see more pictures above that. Uh, and it is located adjacent to the Dix Park property. Um, the home we'll see later, this larger part to the front of the home, was built much later than the part on the left, the earlier part. The main part of the house, you see the larger part, was built by 1860 by Theophilus Hunter Jr. And, but we suspect that when Theophilus Sr. moved closer to uh, the, the Dorothea Dix property in Raleigh, he built this smaller home on the left and was just expanded over the years. Now this is a, a great map of Spring Hill and the plantation and uh, the, the asylum, which again opened its doors in 1856. And this map is from the Civil War. So you see behind the insane asylum as it's labeled, this dark line are the Civil War earthworks, which cut through the property. But it gives you a great uh, insight, a great glimpse onto what the Spring Hill plantation looked like. So this would have still uh, just passed um, right out of the last Hunter family's holdings in 1864. So you see S.H. Young uh, owning Spring Hill at this time. A little farther to the south, you're going to see a uh, label on the map as Grimes. Um, this is the, the Oregon farm of the Grimes family. So this is pretty much where the farmer's market is today. So this beautiful map from the Civil War kind of gives you a little bit of layout on the, the Hunter Plantation in Spring Hill and Oregon Farms. Now this is a, in our research to try to understand who Theophilus Hunter was, we are very lucky to have Belle Long, who you see here. Uh, she's a great descendant of Theophilus Hunter and has been quintessential to help us try to unravel these family roots and to sort of uh, help us get our genealogy straight. And she's an incredible researcher. Uh, and coming up on October 22nd, to give a plug for the Joel Lane House, um, she'll be doing an online presentation about Theophilus Hunter. So please tune into that and get a much better um, uh, comprehensive view of Theophilus Hunter through the eyes of a descendant. So uh, the Joel Lane House would probably appreciate your participation. But yeah, if you're excited about the Alpha Hunter, please tune in to Joel's, uh, Bell's presentation on October 22nd. So check out the Joel Lane House for details on that. But her, her value to this project can't be underestimated to help us understand who the Alpha Hunter was. Now, as we begin to unravel this plantation history of the Dix Park, we decided to pull in as much um, other science to try to tell us what clues to reveal what life was like on the Theophilus Hunter plantation. So using sort of this comparative analysis you see on the bottom, this is a 1938 aerial photograph of the area done by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. At the top is a 2017 Google Earth snapshot. So we can kind of start to, um, to compare physical features of the landscape by, you know, over this uh, almost a hundred year time period. So these are incredible um, uh, tools we have at our disposal to kind of unravel what the mysteries of the landscape were during this time period before the hospital existed. There's also archeological data around Spring Hill, which is still owned by North Carolina State University. Uh, there's been a number of archaeological studies done, and they give us another quick glimpse of what life was like here. You see some of this uh, china, which was discovered uh, around the house. Um, they've done ground penetrating radar uh, and, and ground analysis, so we can start to see what um, structures were where, how the roads have changed. And again, it just provides an incredible intimate glimpse of try to, what life was like here, which we're trying to unravel for our exhibit. Now, of course, as we looked at the Opalist Hunter, uh, we quickly discovered that his wealth was made possible by his human chattel, those enslaved people who he had working on his farm. 
So going through newspapers um, the, and sort of there's a great project through NC Central on runaway ads. And so we started looking around for those in Raleigh and looking around for any Hunter family. And so you see here two ads, I think for um, John, both for John who ran away from Isaac Hunter's plantation. And this is dated from 1817. And these offer an incredible intimate view of the, the enslaved families. We get a uh, description of how high, what color he has, um, uh, what he's wearing, and it's just something that we don't, we really st is missing from the historical record. But these runaway ads are so detailed and provide such an intimate glimpse of what these people looked like, which is something that we had no idea at all through the historical record. So these were quite an interesting find for us as we began to sort of switch from understanding who Theophilus Hunter was to the people who he held on his plantation and worked for him. Another interesting find were the WPA slave narratives. Now, you can't really ask for a more important and more vital source of information for, for any enslaved individual. Um, and it's, it's hit or miss, but we found two hunters that were interviewed in the 1930s which talked about their own experiences in their own words. Um, it's an incredibly intimate document about what life was like as a slave. So uh, here you see um, Albert Hunter, who uh, was interviewed and was lucky enough to have his image captured uh, during the Depression when a lot of these writers went out to interview former slaves. So again, two little bits of, of little information, and we don't know uh, much about these two men, and we don't think they were connected to Dick's Park, but bearing that hunter name raised some flags for us, is that, and it, we, we asked an important question. If we are trying to understand what life was like for the slaves on the hunter plantation, we had to follow them through the rest of their lives. And were there, um, after emancipation in 1865, were there African Americans who took the last name of Hunter that we can trace back to the Dick's, the plantation was there or where Dick's Park was. So this kind of set us on a new direction to sort of discover um, any connections that we could with those people who had been out at Dick's Park. Now also pulling back uh, more records, we learned that, yeah, most of Theophilus Hunter's prosperity came with enslaved people. And we were shocked to find that in 1790, just as Raleigh's about to be the new state capital, he is the second largest slave owner in Wake County with, it, with 47 folks. And so that was, that was very revealing that we suddenly discovered that the, the enslaved community of Dix was playing a bigger part in the story that we originally thought. So with this amount of people and the amount of land, um, we were very curious to, to start to, to dig into this a little more. And so that really put the more emphasis for us to find some of these descendants and to sort of look at what happened to these enslaved people after they were free. So again, with this jackpot, came with his will. In 1798, Theophilus Hunter dies, and of course, leaves all of his possessions, both human, uh, livestock, material goods, to his family. So we were able to go down his will and extract the names of his enslaved community. So this gives us an incredible list. To put a name with a person is, is pretty valuable for doing African-American research during slavery. Um, so these are a list of his people who he gave to his family. Now the ones in red are, are people that we were able to add at least some detail that, that they pop up somewhere else in the historical record just to give us some extra fact about who these people were. Now to give you some context, in 1798 when Theophilus Hunter dies, he has about 59 or 60 people in an, is enslaved property. Now compare that to the total population of Raleigh in 1798, which only about 669 people. His enslaved community represented about 9% of the entire population of Raleigh. So that's kind of an incredible number that um, 
this was a, a fairly large um, operation, plantation, um, scattered probably across Wake County. Um, and it was uh, it's sizable. So this was sort of a great find for us to say, hey, these are the names we need to start with. These are at least the names of the folks that we can, again, to assign a name to an experience at Dick's Park. We were able to sort of take um, the Hunter family genealogy to take his will and to do something that, that to put together where these people and how they were distributed from Hunter's family. So all of these red numbers you see beside the family are where these slaves went to. You know, 10 slaves went to his wife, Jane Williams. His son, Theophilus Jr. got nine. And so it is distributed across the family. So in order to track where these people go as they're handed down from generation to generation, from person to person, we have to understand the, the genealogy of the slave master's family to understand where the slaves went. So this is another step in trying to track these people. So 60s, trying to, to do genealogy before 1865 for African-American families is really, really hard. If you look at a lot of the census records, they're only a, 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 a sex, um, an age, and a color. So their identities are stripped away. So it's only like documents with this will that actually puts a name to these folks that we begin to be able to discover their identity and give them back some, um, some dignity by starting to tell their stories. Here it is. Here is the Rosetta Stone almost. I mean, this was the one document that really set this mystery in motion. Um, what you're looking at is the 1870 census. And it is incredibly important for anybody doing African-American genealogy. It is the first time where black folks have a last name. They are free people now. So this last name. Um, and in going to the 1870 census, page after page, looking for people of color who have this hunter name to see if, again, can we trace any of these people back to Theopolis Hunter and the Dix Park? So as I was going down to the census, uh, I made an incredible discovery, and this is it. So if you look at household 291, you see Robert Lucas. Underneath him is his wife, Emmeline. They're living with Stuart Ellison, um, Sophie Ellison, and it goes down to John Hunter. And if you look at the, the most amazing thing about John Hunter is his age. So this is 1870. At age 101, that means he would have been born in like 1769. And so when I saw this, I was like, wait a second, this is something, and he has the last name of Hunter. So does he have a connection to Theophilus Hunter? And how old he had seen so long, 1760, if you think about all the history he had seen, that's an incredible life. So this really put the hook in me to find out who John Hunter was. So, Doing research in the digital era now is incredibly fast and you have access to so many databases. So simply plugging in John Hunter's name in the newspapers.com gave me this. And this is really the most important document of the entire presentation. It seemed that Uncle John, because of his age and because all he had seen, earned him a obituary in the Raleigh newspapers upon his death. He dies in 1876. And this little, this little snippet is only uh, one of a couple of other obituaries, and these are most longer. But to find this is incredible. It talks about living with the residence of his um, grandson, Stuart Ellison. Um, it talks a little bit about his family. He talks about he was the property of Theophilus Hunter. And he goes in to say that, you know, as a boy, he remembered the Declaration of Independence in 1776. He remembers British soldiers operating below Raleigh during the Revolutionary War. Incredibly, he accompanied his master to Norfolk during the War of 1812, the second time he fought the British. And it's just an incredible little snapshot of Uncle John's life. 
So, but what this really does, the most value in this is it gives us a little bit of his genealogy. He talks about who he's living with and just a little clues. So looking at the census and comparing this newspaper article, this is what really set us on fire at the city of Raleigh Museum. And we asked the craziest of questions. Could we trace Uncle John's family to today? Could this be possible? From the 1760s to 2020, could we find descendants of John Hunter? Personally, I was not optimistic. Often, you know, doing genealogy for African Americans where records are, are poor and kind of they're filtered through, you know, the Jim Crow segregation of the South and all these filters. I didn't think that this was possible. But, you know, as a fun exercise as a historian, I decided to kind of see what, how far I could go with this story before I hit. So this much we know, this much popped up from the historical record. When John was kind of born, his daughter, who she married, Stuart Ellison, um, and we kind of put together at least this spanning um, from 1760 to 1860. So this is, this is kind of heavy lifting because it gets us to the, the very beginnings of the Civil War. And again, 1870 census is not that far around the corner when Sophia, Elizabeth, and Mary are born. So the search begins. We find this is a marriage certificate between Stuart Ellison and Narcissa Lucas. So again, the historical record provides some document that an emancipation, when, after slave marriages were not allowed, the first thing many couples do is get their marriage validated in the Reconstruction era. And so this is it. This is from 1866. We see that Stuart and Narcissa began to have their marriage um, solidified under the new laws of the, the post-Civil War North Carolina government. So you can imagine my shock when I decided to move on to Stuart Ellison and research him. I was blown away to find out who he was. Um, Stuart Ellison amazingly had worked to build the asylum, so which was basically in the front yard of Spring Hill Plantation, where John Hunter was, and in his front yard, Stuart Ellison was working to, as a carpenter to build the asylum. So that's a strange connection right there. Did they meet at that time? I don't know. But Stuart Ellison went on to have an incredibly valuable career to African American history for the state. He was part of the first Freedmen's Convention in October of 1865. He was one of the first African Americans elected to the Board of Commissioners for the City of Raleigh, the early um, city council. Um, he served six terms in the General Assembly, one of the first African Americans elected after the Civil War, and spent three terms as the director of the state penitentiary. So Stuart Ellison has a long career and a post-Civil War career as an architect. So that's an incredible part of the story that Uncle John's granddaughter married this incredibly influential um, and talented African-American man. So that was intriguing and that kind of added a little fuel to the fire to the mystery. I was also shocked to find in this family tree Colonel James Hunter Young who's here in the center. Now on the far left is Dr. Manasseh T. Pope. Now, in addition to running the um, City of Raleigh Museum, we also managed the Manassas T. Pope House, which is a, a house museum located on Wilmington Street. So Colonel James Hunter Young married into the Hunter family. Now, why James, James Hunter Young is so incredibly important is that he was a very early black newspaper publisher in the city. And as you can see from this photograph, both him and Dr. Pope um, joined the 3rd North Carolina Infantry to fight during the Spanish-American War. Now, this is an incredibly important uh, unit. It was sort of a political experiment. Um, during the Civil War, they had been black soldiers, but they had served under white officers. And in 1898, when, this, uh, when America goes to war with Spain, um, this was a political experiment to see if black soldiers could serve under black officers. 
So Colonel James Hunter Young was the, the in charge of the regiment and Dr. Pope had served on his staff. So that's a, a whole nother connection I had not seen in this family tree. But as we sort of talk more about this family tree, it gets more and more interesting. In this family tree is a James Young Carter. Uh, I think the grandson of the James Hunter Young who served um, as a Tuskegee Airman in World War II and becomes one of the first black congressmen to serve in the Illinois um, State House. So that's an incredible lineage that spans directly from Stuart Ellison of this political activism in this family. And I found this lady in the family tree and I think this is the most fabulous, glamorous picture I could show you. And this is Beatrice Turner. And again, through this family, uh, married into the Hunters. And now what's amazing about her is that she is a Hiawatha Saponi Native American from the Eastern part of the state. So this family, as I'm researching this family, it just becomes more and more incredible. And it's turning into this family tree where we find so many people involved at critical and amazing points in American history but it keeps on going. In this same branch of the family is Liz Williamson. Um, she became a, a influential dancer in the 1950s and 60s and sort of redefined the modern jazz dance movement and danced with the Alvin Ailes Company in New York, which was you know, one of the quintessential uh, African-American dance troops that sort of redefined so much of the dance movement. So I was like, wow. <laughs> this is an interesting find in this tree. So, taking this story on up to the present to find these people, to sort of put together a family tree, it started to fall into place. So I had tracked this family up into, you see, Christine Carter Lynch. And trying to find modern people is a little difficult, difficult and different and finding people of the past. That's kind of difficult. Trying to stalk people on the internet who are still living is a little difficult. So now that I know that these people are living, how in the world do I find them? That's the hard part. So another branch of the tree had got down to these three people you see at the bottom, Winetta, Wayne, and Wanda. And I knew that these folks were living uh, somewhere and I narrowed them down to New York. Um, so I managed to get a phone number for Wayne. And so you can imagine that me, a uh, white guy from the South, with a little bit of a twang calling Brooklyn, New York and leaving a message on your answering machine saying, hey, I've discovered your slave ancestry. Will you give me a call back? Well, Wayne told me later that he truly thought it was a scam and ignored it. But undaunted, I decided to look around and, and anybody who's doing Historical research looks for folks with unique names that kind of stand out. You know, researching a John Smith is always difficult, but a Winetta Worthy, that may have some, some, some traction for it. So I was able to track down Winetta and I found out she had married a guy named Ray Figuola. And Googling him, I found that he worked at Pratt University in New York. So I crafted a Hail Mary email and sent it to Ray saying, hey, I know this is gonna sound like a crazy story, but are you married to Winetta Worthy? I have an incredible story to tell her. And so fortunately for Ray, wrote back and said, yeah, I am married to Winetta. And we were able to talk on the phone and I was blown away that she had no, no knowledge whatsoever of her family in Raleigh or this incredible family tree. And that's what really started the second part of this story is to actually bring these people back to where their family roots began. So in November of last year, November 2019, um, I extended an invitation to Winetta and her husband to come down and sort of to, to re-engage and to learn this history of where their, their ancestors were and sort of follow in their footprints. And as it got closer, um, Winetta said, oh, we will be eight of us coming down. And as it got closer, there's gonna be 15 of us coming down. And then by the, the week before they were supposed to arrive, there were 20 some people that were coming down from New York and Washington who are part of this family to hear the story. 
And I thought it was incredible. These people would take a blind leap of faith based on my research to come down and to put their trust in me to take them through what could be a fairly painful part of their family history. So this is the part of family who we met in the museum uh, uh, to sort of, sort of do a game plan of what their tour would be like. And uh, it, was, it was amazing because a lot of this family had not met the other side of the family. The family had grown apart over the years and the New York branch had, had been in touch with a little bit from their Washington family, but some of these folks were meeting for the first time. So that was a, an incredible experience that I had no idea was gonna be a byproduct of this. So here they are. Our first stop on the tour that November day was the Spring Hill Plantation. Um, and, you know, one of the most powerful images for me is for this family to be back here at this house, which their, their family built in 1860, right, to see this site and to actually be able to put their hands on something that their ancestors had put their hands on. The next stop, we went out to Mount Hope Cemetery, and which is a, a, uh, the African American Cemetery in Raleigh, started in 1872. And we believe that both Stuart Ellison and John Hunter are buried out here somewhere in unmarked graves. But what we did is we were able to find several members of their family, which you know, they had no idea were there, and uh, just sort of just walk around the cemetery and to, to be around those people that they were descended from was an incredible, meaningful moment in the tour. Um, so we ended the tour um, at St. Paul's AME Church. Um, now St. Paul's is incredibly critical to the entire Hunter family. Uh, when we got to the church, um, you know, we heard about how Stuart Ellison had built this church, you know, as a, as a, as a builder and as an architect in freedom, worked on his church for his family and for his community. And, uh, you know, so many of uh, the, the folks who worked at the church, you know, uh, gave us a talk and we were able to walk around and um, just to be in the space that, that, that were, was built by their ancestors and to be such a, an intimate space and such a beautiful church, it was an incredible opportunity. Now, for me, if you've ever been to St. Paul's, they, the, they have these incredible, beautiful stained glass windows, an amazing feature of the church. And I felt that, you know, uh, these, these windows had to have a mystery in them. And so many churches, you see names of the donors of the churches and, and who kept, uh, raised money for these churches. And so we looked around and I saw this window on the second floor. So I ran upstairs and sure enough, if you look at this image across the bottom are the names of all the women who raised the funds for these windows. And sure enough, these people found some of their family enshrined in these stained glass windows who helped raise the funds for it. So that was an amazingly, surprisingly meaningful discovery that I had no idea what was there. So uh, by the end of the trip, uh, they, were, they were truly blown away by you know, their family's impact on the city, on the region, um, on their community, and uh, just their connection to a deeper past and a connection to each other that um, it, it continues, continues to grow. Um, uh, I got the rare opportunity to, because of this project, and because of them coming down in November, um, they've sort of rediscovered a sense of family and, and to meet parts of their, their extended family who they never knew. So we, I went to the, um, they invited me to their virtual family reunion a couple weeks ago, which was a lot of fun. I wish my family reunions were that exciting and, and, and just as laughed a lot. But uh, one of the things that we did when we came down is we shot a small documentary about their experience and kind of explaining the project. So the video, uh, we did a, a Zoom chat where we premiered the video last week and we had the family kind of talk about what this experience meant to them uh, to consider their family and consider what would be the how would their family's memory be a part of the Dix Park moving forward? So it's a fascinating conversation on memory and family and what it all means to not only this group of people, but for us in Raleigh and this story. 
So I encourage you to go uh, check out this Zoom session on, on the City of Raleigh YouTube page and you'll get to see the video and hear some of the family's reaction. And so right above me in this picture is Juanetta and Ray. So they are the first ones that I made contact and they have been embraced this project wholeheartedly and really helped me sort of pull together the family and to, to spread the word on this. So it's, a, it's an incredible conversation just to, 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 to listen to and see what this incredible story that spans three centuries meant to these folks. But the story continues. And as you saw at Theopolis Hunter's Will, there are 59 other names of people we want to bring into this story. Now, Winetta and her family had gone north during the Great Migration to get away from the south in the 30s and 40s. But there are a lot more hunter family around Raleigh. And these are just two local hunters that we're trying to plug into the story. Um, Charles and Hunter was an incredibly uh, profound educator after the Civil War. How does he fit into this story? And on the right is John M. Hunter, whose mother was Narcissa. And these are sort of family names that go down through generations. So the next part of the story is for us to talk to more local folks to get these genealogies and stories where we can really tie them back to these original 60 names and to kind of give them this dignity by telling their story, to uncover it and hope it will be a part of the Dix Park moving forward. So this is, a, if anybody's interested or has knows some connections or want to share their family histories, this is how you get in touch with us at the City of Raleigh Museum. And uh, we're going to be working with the Dix Park folks to do some more oral histories, to tell these stories, um, to kind of pull them out of the fog of the past, and to make sure that they're not forgotten again. And as you go to Dix Park, uh, these stories will hopefully be become a part of the future of the park. And that is the short version of a long story that spans a long time, but it's not ended yet, which is the most exciting part, that we hope that in the future, there are more stories to pull out of the Hunter family and um, that will help us understand the history of Dix Park in a way that has never been looked at. And hopefully, as the park develops, that these stories will be in there for the next generation to, to learn about. So thanks for tuning in today. Okay, okay um, Ernie, we have some questions for you. Um, one of the first ones is, was a slave cemetery found? And I'm not sure where the questioner was asking about, but perhaps yeah. near Spring Hill? That's a great question. Um, there is, you know, the Theophilus Hunter himself is buried adjacent to um, Spring Hill. And that's a, this, where the, probably where the White family were located. Um, ground penetrating radar is located about 17 headstones in the White Cemetery, but only his headstone put in the 1940s exists. There is another area northwest of the house that we suspect that may be a slave cemetery. It's really hard and with not very much evidence to tell where that is, but we have our suspicions that we may know where that is, but it's going to take a little bit more archaeological research to, to confirm. Okay, um, next question. Do you know who the largest slave owner in the area was? Ooh, yeah, um, and this was a guy named Osborne uh, who who basically was sort of in the Lewisburg area at that time. So he had a grand total of 67 slaves at that time. So uh, Thomas Osborne, I think. Okay. Um, this one's a, a nice broad question for you. How can we find our roots? Uh, that's that's the, the amazing question. Um, there are so many digital archives out there now that it makes it a lot easier. and. You know, through the museum, we found that Ancestry.com, a shameless plug for them, was incredibly valuable. Now, you can get access to a lot of these databases used to do the family research through a lot of the local libraries. Um, the libraries have a lot of subscriptions. So if you have a, like a Wake County library card, you can gain access to a lot of these databases that will give you an incredibly um, great head start to look up your history. Okay. Um... Ernie, are you going to be digitizing these family histories? That's a great question. Yes. Um, we were trying to figure out if we, we go through the museum or the Pope House as a, a repositories of these. And, you know, one of the best things for us is if we share this history 
and use this as a platform for other people to add, connect to, is really going to help this Hunter Family Project go faster and be more comprehensive. So I would probably think uh, that in the coming months that once we kind of solidify our family tree and kind of, kind of pull together Uncle John's story a little tighter, we'll probably be pushing this out and hopefully other people can share it and kind of connect into it. So yeah, that's our plan is to sort of build a digital platform for all the research that we've found. Okay. Um, have you arranged any meetings between the descendants of the hunter slave owners and the descendants of the enslaved? That's a great question. Um, and so I was, I was very cognizant of, you know, of, of this divide. And when the hunter family came down in November, I was be sure to ask, bell uh, to come out and you know it's i think that as we move forward and you know there's been a lot of projects from you know, thomas jefferson on down of, of when slave owners the sins of slave owners and sins of slaves come together that this is the this is the best way to heal some of these um these emotions that uh, kind of sort of festered for for centuries and sort of to add healing and to bring these people together is, is kind of important. So yeah, uh, we invited the, the Hunter family to both, both black and white to attend. And uh, Bell has been incredibly invaluable at helping us do a lot of this research on the enslaved community. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's a great testament to her to help us in this process. And, you know, we can't really do it without her incredible knowledge of her family's past in order to help tell another family's past. So yes. Um, th Stacy, this is a bit of a question for you. Uh, the recording, will there be a recording of this that folks can access later? Yes, so we are recording this today and it's usually available within about a week of the production date. So about a week within today's date uh, with captions provided as well. Okay. Okay, Ernie, we have a pl we have a request here. Are you going to write a book? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, you know, as this story continues to grow, um, it's it's a fascinating story. It's an American story, and it's just becoming more voluminous the more we talk to the family and get more researches. So, um, I, I would love to see this evolve into something. And you know, there's a lot of talk about how the park will develop, about moving. Um, Raleigh's African-American cultural complex to Dick's Park. So I think this story will certainly be, you can go to Dick's Park in the future and learn the story and explore more of the nuances. A book, I'd love to, but I'm not sure if I've got it left in me, but you know, the future is unwritten. Okay. And there is, um, um, to develop on that, you mentioned this a bit, but uh, folks say there should be space for the story on the Dick's campus um, are there plans for exhibits somewhere on the Dix campus in the future? I think so. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about um, the, the Dix Park Conservancy, which is like the nonprofit that supports the park, um, is, is very, um, they really want to tell a lot of these stories. They've, they're part of the International Sites of Consciousness, um, Conscience. And so they feel a responsibility to tell the whole story of the Dix Park you know, both bad and good. And so this is quintessential to the heart of that mission is to, you know, to tell the story. And so I, I firmly believe that as the story grows and we pull more people into it, it's going to be uh, a robust story that people can go to Dix Park and follow around and go to these different sites and to learn this history. And, you know, if, if nothing else, Dix Parks has a very long and complicated history. And there's a lot of narratives that we're still working to tell. And I think this is going to be one of those uh, essential stories that Dix Park has to tell in the future. Okay. Um, we have another suggestion for you. Would you be considered, would you consider doing a podcast? I think so. This story just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, if you look at all of these folks in the family tree, you could do a podcast on each and every one of these these people in this family tree. And it's just a crazy, wonderful American family story. You know, um, yeah, I would, I would love to find some time to sit down and, and do a podcast. 
um, and to kind of share more of the story, because you guys got sort of the, the windshield view of the story, but there are many more nuances and it goes much deeper than I was able to share with today. Okay. Uh, one last question we have about uh, the WPA reference you used as a resource, and could you give some pointers as to where people could start getting an idea about how to use those narratives as a resource? Right. Um, so all these are digitized online, I think, to the Library of Congress. Um, and simply just, um, you can either search by name, um, which, is, which is sometimes a little problematic about, you know, slaves taking owners' last names and that. But you can also search by locations. And, um, it, you know, a lot of times when people were enslaved in North Carolina, they moved to Arkansas. So um, these WPA narratives are quintessential if you're doing any African-American genealogy to look through these, not only to try to find a, a rare glimpse of evidence of a family, but just to understand what life was like and how they remember that experience. Um, you just really cannot get away from using this as an incredible valuable resource. So I would go to the Library of Congress and start poking around and in these, in these narratives. Um, they are, they are rewarding, they're sad, they're happy, they're all over the place, but that's any, any research has to begin there. Okay. Well, Ernie, um, more, many, many mentions. Um, thank you, thank you. Excellent research and presentation. Um, a lot of people want to make sure that they can um, access it and listen to it again. So thank you so much. Folks are uh, really appreciative. Oh, well, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, I'm happy to share the story. I'm, I'm humbled to to, to, to find it and to, to present it to folks. And, you know, on behalf of the family, uh, they are just thrilled that um, they have recovered a missing part of their past. And they are just an incredibly warm, um, gregarious family who are really embracing this story. So um, I think it's just an incredible opportunity for the City of Raleigh Museum, the Diggs Park, and this family to come together and to, to talk about a topic that not many people talk about. And, and to help it, use it in the future to shape Dix Park. So I'm just, I'm just the messenger for it. So thank you guys for tuning in and sharing the story with me. Thank you so much, Ernie. This is incredible. Uh, we really appreciate it. Guys, we've shared the link to the City of Raleigh Museum's uh, YouTube channel in the chat, so you can check out that video that Ernie mentioned. Um, please head over and have a look. It's incredible. Uh, thank you so much, Ernie. This has been really wonderful, and we look forward to hearing where the story takes you next. I am too. So thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it, Stacey. Thanks y'all for joining us. Join us later this month. Keep an eye on our social media. We will be having another uh, History at High Noon and we hope to see you there. Take care everyone. Have a good day. Bye.